Thompson, go ahead. Good afternoon, and may it please the court. David Thompson, on behalf of the appellants in both the New York and the Connecticut cases. In Heller, the Supreme Court laid out a clear test for possession of firearms in the home. The court made clear that states and localities cannot ban possession of a firearm in the home if that firearm is typically possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes. And here we have a ban on the affected firearms and magazines. It extends to the home. And so the only question is whether these firearms are typically possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes. And the state bears the burden on that question because the Supreme Court was clear in Heller that the Second Amendment prima facie extends to all bearable arms. And the evidence, even if we had the burden, is overwhelming on this. With respect to commonality of the banned firearms. Uh, they are the most popular rifles in America. There are 8 million of them in circulation. They are owned by 4.8 million people, 92% of whom are not current law enforcement officials. Judge Scretany found they were popular. And the Supreme Court in Staples said they have, quote, traditionally have been widely accepted as lawful possessions. And we know that they're owned for lawful purposes, both from the survey data, which show that the number one reason for owning them is target practice, and then the number two reason, according to the survey data, is self-defense. We know this from the ATF, which in 1989, in its report, which the defendants have cited, recognized that many individuals purchased these firearms for self-defense. Now, with respect to magazines, these two are extremely common. There are 75... Can we just go back to guns for the assault weapons for a second? Yes. Then why did the court specifically say that M16s can be banned? Well, M16s are different, uh, the court has said, than the AR-15, which in Staples it said was... But the only level. difference is that it has a fully automatic feature, right? And, and burst. Uh, th there's also a burst capability where you can fire three bullets at the same time. But yes, that is... The and there's plenty of evidence in the record that says that uh, putting it on fully automatic is not as, as useful as the semi-automatic... Uh, approach. Isn't it? It, it, it would depend on what the purpose were. If you were trying to have sort of cover, you know, there are certain combat purposes and instances where you would want the fully automatic feature. But yes, in many instances, the Army manual says the most effective way to use the weapon is in semi-automatic mode. That's right. So how are we to take that language in Heller that says M16s can be banned? And say, but our AR-15s with large magazines should not be. Well, and Heller, Heller gives us the test, Your Honor. It says, are they typically possessed? Are they commonly possessed? And when you're talking about the most c common and popular rifle in the United States with 8 million of them in circulation, then it necessarily follows that and this... Was that the reason why the court said M16s can be banned? Because there are not, not many people have them? Or because, yes. they, or because they're dangerous and unusual and typically used in military situations. What was the reason for the court saying you can ban M16? Right. The test is for dangerous and unusualness is whether it's typically possessed by law-abiding citizens. And machine guns in this country are not typically possessed. There was a period of approximately 10 years where people could go out and buy machine guns without... How do we figure out what's typically possessed? Well, uh, Your Honor, when uh, I would say that when you're... dealing the number bandied around of 2%. It's just 2%. That we're right. About. Well, there are four problems with the 2% number, Your Honor. First of all, we shouldn't be talking about percentages. Everyone in America could own one, but if they owned more of something else, then, you know, the percentage would be low. Number two, it's the de there's a denominator problem because that 2% says, well, there's 8 million, but there's 310 million out firearms in the United States, but that's a non-perishable stock. You should be looking at, well, what's the functioning firearms? And currently about 7 to 8% how long have these uh, firearms been the best-selling uh, firearms in the country? Your Honor, uh, they, there have been, um, I don't know how long, but certainly since so the 1990s. Was, uh, and and, and the, the, the 80s. Since the 1990s, but yep. before that, they'd really been um, uh, uh, almost seldom, really rarely sold. Let's, uh, just, I, let's just say that. Okay, I don't let's agree, just, but go ahead. It's a hypothetical. Um, then what would the typical, uh, the typicality analysis look like? It, it would depend on how many. What was the absolute number that had been sold during that 20 or 25 year period? If it's 8 million, it, you know, that, then that's not 
unusual. I mean, they're two percent of the market is Volkswagens. One point four percent is Priuses. No one would say a Prius or a Volkswagen is highly unusual, and that was the test in Heller. Highly unusual. And when you have eight million of something, it is not highly unusual. If I may switch to the well, magazine, you, 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 whether it's usual or not, because uh, the court opinion in Heller also talks about the handgun being very appropriate for the type of protection the Second Amendment countenances, which is protection in the home. It's easy. It's easier to use. It's not heavy. You can use the phone while you're doing it. All those things that the, the court mentioned in Heller. Are these are the AR-15s and the other assault weapons? Uh, is there is there a statistical basis to believe that they're used for protection in the home, or are they t are they typically used? for sporting purposes. Well, we have the survey data, Your Honor, which shows that that's the number two reason why people have them. We have the ATF. Number two? Yes, the second. second. What's the first reason? Sporting, yes. Uh, we also have the ATF data saying that many individuals, in 1989, the ATF said many individuals buy these for self-defense. We also have Judge Scretany saying there is no and cannot be any dispute that these features that are banned make them easier to use. They have less recoil. They are more ac accurate. And the other thing is they have less penetrating firepower. One of the things that the state, both states, completely and utterly ignore is what were the less restrictive alternatives and what will happen if people substitute, let's say, a traditional hunting rifle for home defense in lieu of an AR-15, a traditional hunting rifle, the record shows, and there's no dispute about this, has far more penetration through walls and apartments and homes, collateral damage. There is not one scintilla of evidence. So, uh, wait, wait. so there are a number of police chiefs, the Hartford police chief, there's uh, Lucy Allen, there are other affidavits in the record that indicate that the um, semi-automatic rifles uh, are far more able to penetrate walls, particularly in the, an apartment kind of I, I don't recall, Your Honor, Lucy Allen speaking to that. I thought she was an economist. But in any event, there's a two two three caliber, and the, the, the firepower of a rifle uh, of a traditional three aught six well, it just goes through the wall. It's it's much more. It's not Lucy Ellen. It's two. It's an ADA and Kathleen Rice. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Um, but the reality is, the states have not engaged in any analysis uh, of what will happen on substitution. And if I may, one of the things they say in their briefs is that there should be substantial deference given to what the, the legislature is fine. And there are some problems with that. Number one, they need to have, quote, substantial evidence. That's what Turner 1 and Turner 2 says, substantial evidence that it will, in fact, advance and alleviate the harm in a material way. And here, if we look at what their handpicked expert said, Mr. Coper, he said there is little evidence Little, not substantial evidence, little evidence that an assault, uh, whether an assault weapon ban at the state level will actually work. He also said that it is, quote, unknown. He said it is unknown whether there will be any incremental benefit whatsoever to a ban on assault weapons as compared to the, the magazines that are banned. So when their own expert says, I don't know, it's unknown as to whether there will be any incremental benefit to the uh, assault this, weapons. Statistic, though, it seems to be generally agreed that in the spree shootings, the mass shootings, that there's a combination of an assault weapon and a large capacity magazine. There's evidence in the record, Judge Scretany found it, that over 50% of recent mass shootings use the combination of the two. Isn't that relevant to whether the, the, the combination is important to consider? Well, Your Honor, if you ban one and not the other, you won't have the combination anymore, okay? So that would be the first point I would make. And it's interesting, that 50% number comes from the Mother Jones uh, analysis. Number one, Mother Jones, oftentimes, they don't purport to claim that they know what was used. They just know what firearms were found there. They don't know what was used. Number two, there were two instances out of 62 where only uh, one of the banned firearms was used. Well, Roper, Roper made the same conclusion. Dr. Roper, I also found that assault weapons and other firearms with large capacity magazines are used in a higher share of mass public shootings and killings of law enforcement officers. Well, 
Well, and Your Honor, if I may, just I was going to say about the Mother Jones piece, that there are two instances in which you only had a firearm with a banned feature, so-called assault weapon, without the large capacity magazine. In both instances, there was less fatality and less injury. Less fatality, less injury. And it makes sense because when we talk about these banned features, what are we talking about? We're talking about a thumb hole stock. That is the ho a hole in the back of a stock. The notion that that somehow turns this, you know, what, what the Supreme Court said has traditionally been widely accepted as a lawful possession uh, into some sort of weapon of war is, is ridiculous. And that's why in Staples, uh, the Supreme Court said, no, that's not right. Um, if I may, um, also say, wholly apart from the failure to have substantial evidence, uh, on these points uh, with respect to the, the assault uh, weapons that they ban. There's also a lack of uh, substantial evidence on the magazines themselves. For their argument to be right, they have to have evidence that criminals will not use these magazines if they are banned. We have empirical experience on that in this country. For 10 years, these magazines were banned throughout the United States, any sale of them, and their own expert admits there was no diminution whatsoever in the extent to which criminals engaged in gun violence, and number two, used the magazines. And it's a little surprise because they are so common. There are 75 million of them. And here, it'll be even less potent. Was that, was that 10 rounds or was that, what was it? I, I believe it was 10 rounds, Your Honor, yes. And um, uh, is, is there any experience in this country with, and I think your answer is going to be no, but I want to make sure that I'm right, with uh, a, a, a seven round limit? No, Your Honor, and there is certainly no experience in this country with a gun regulation which allows criminals to have the magazine and ask them to voluntarily not put in the last three bullets and not use them when they're going on their shooting spree. This is, uh, you know, Judge Scretney said, it just stretches uh, credibility too far to suggest. But we're not talking about the 10 to 7. We're talking oh, about okay. the 30, uh, the 30 uh, rounds in a, in a magazine problem. Yes, and, the, and, the, uh, and and you're saying uh, don't bother to outlaw them because there's so many around that they'll be available to criminals anyway. So our best defense is to let uh, law-abiding citizens have large capacity magazines too. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's the 94. That's the experience in part uh, of what the 94 law says. I mean, uh, the, the 94 experience. Their own expert, Professor Coper, said there was no diminution in fatalities, no di diminution but in injuries. Sweeney from Connecticut did say that the early prohibition in Connecticut of that had an effect, in his view. Isn't that right? Well, there is uh, expert evidence in the record of that. Uh, Your, Your Honor, I, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, you, you may be right. Uh, but I would say uh, also to go back to the fact that Heller is very clear that when you're talking about banning these things in the public, uh, in the home, which Kachalski said is the zenith, that is the zenith, whether we're talking Lawrence or Griswold, and they have less restrictive alternatives uh, that they can and had to consider. Turner 1 and Turner 2 and Rock versus War, uh, Ward versus Rock Against Racism all said that they cannot burden more of the right than is necessary. And one thing they could have done is look at carriage rules if they decided. Uh, the, the, another thing they could have looked at is mental health. And there are extensive regulations about mental health, but there's not a single finding to defer to that the mental health rules and the storage rules will not solve the problem of mass shootings. They don't have any consideration or any evidence of that uh, that they've put forward. Um, if I may, there's also in the briefs a suggestion that these weapons are used disproportionately. That's wrong on the law and the facts. On the law, it's wrong because this was the centerpiece of the District of Columbia's defense in Heller. They said, look, the uh, handguns are only 33% of the gun stock, but they're used in 87% of the, the violent gun crime. These are disproportionate. These should be outlawed. And the Supreme Court said no. Um, in addition, it's wrong on the facts because Professor Coper, and this is at Joint Appendix of New York 464, said that in looking prior to 1994, only 2% of the firearms used in crime were uh, the banned weapons. And it's true, they have an 8% number, but that comes from tracing data. And Professor Coper, again, their expert, not ours, said that tracing data 
But number one, it's not a, it's a, uh, it is not a uh, random sample. Uh, it's only 1% of the, of the guns that are used in crimes other than homicide, 17% of the homicide guns. And that, uh, the, and it over represents and over samples the assault weapons. That's at New York 48990. And I see that I'm about to go into my rebuttal time. Barbara Underwood for New York. Uh, the New York law does not ban handguns, as the law in Heller did. It doesn't ban semi-automatic weapons. It bans or restricts certain features that promote the rapid firing of a large number of rounds. That is, magazines with a capacity of more than 10 rounds. And for semi-automatics with detachable magazines, various features that are used and needed to control the recoil and the overheating that go along with fast firing of a large number of rounds. That's the extra grip and the barrel shroud and the muzzle brake and so forth. Under New York law, a person can have as many features of those features as they want if they fix a magazine to their semi-automatic rifle or pistol. It's a combination of detachable magazine and those features that the state has identified as creating the, the, the particular problem here, and the ability to fire a large number of rounds quickly without reloading, which is what this restricts, is not essential to the core Second Amendment right of armed self-defense, and yet it is an important cause of injury and death to law enforcement officers and to the victims of mass shootings at schools, shopping malls, movie theaters, and workplaces. Restricting those features, not guns, but features, uh, may not implicate the Second Amendment right at all because they aren't central to that self-defense right and they are characteristic of military weapons or especially dangerous weapons. Or it may impose such an insubstantial burden on the Second Amendment right as not to require heightened scrutiny under De Castro. But given the legal uncertainties in this area, it seems prudent to analyze the statute under heightened scrutiny, assuming without deciding that that is required, and for that purpose, the appropriate level of scrutiny is intermediate for three reasons. The law imposes a burden and not a ban on weapons. It is not a severe burden, and it's consistent with the decisions of every other circuit court that has attempted to define the appropriate level of scrutiny. On the first point, that it imposes a burden rather than a ban, which this court said was important in Quang. So you, you would agree, um, maybe not, but what's your position with respect to um, how typical or in common use these assault weapons are for purposes of our Well, I think there's an, there's an argument which we've made in, in our brief that, that, uh, that they aren't sufficiently used to be uh, protected by the Second Amendment and that they are closer to the military weapons that Heller reserved than to the commonly used weapons. But I don't think it's, um, as I say, I don't think it's prudent to rest the decision in this case on that ground, although we'd be happy for that to be an alternative uh, ruling. Um, I do think the law is can be regarded as very similar to time, place, and manner regulation in First Amendment law. Uh, just as the First Amendment permits the state to regulate the volume of speech, the noise level, so too the Second Amendment permits the state to regulate the volume of gunfire, the number of rounds that can be fired without pause. And that's all this is, the number of rounds that can be fired without a pause uh, to reload. In fact, um, plaintiffs in their uh, second brief at page 22 observe that the effect of the magazine ban is to outlaw, they say, firearms capable of firing more than 10 rounds without reloading. I would just say... Can I, can I ask you about the loading provision that Judge Scrutiny uh, said uh, yes. was uh, unconstitutional? Yes. And that is, it, it doesn't it make sense, though, if you have a 10-round capacity in a magazine, but you say that you can only put ten, seven rounds, then he may be right that well, the only people that would not put the full 10 rounds in our law-abiding citizens, that if you can still buy a 10-round magazine, a criminal is always going to put in the 10 rounds. So does it make any sense to have the 7-round the loading limit, as, as Judge Scrutiny thought it did not? It does. It, even on the predicate that the only people who will comply with it are law-abiding people, um, it's harder to enforce for them 
for that reason because it's not it's hard to enforce because it's not addressed to manufacturers it's addressed to the user and and because you can only expect compliance from law-abiding citizens but if law-abiding citizens keep their magazines loaded at seven rather than ten to that extent it will protect bystanders from the event from those last three bullets in the event several things could happen somebody who wasn't the law-abiding person could obtain a child another member of the household a thief could obtain that gun someone or, or the law the normally law-abiding citizen could have a moment of rage and where did it come from where's the number seven the number seven my to the best of my i, I i'm advised that the determination that the, advised <laughs> that the legislature w was making a compromise between people who wanted 10 and people who wanted 5, both of, which, no, both of those numbers were out there, and originally it was going to be a 7 capacity limit. So it was going to be magazines that, that, that uh, only had a 7 capacity. They picked the number 7 as adequate to provide for self-defense and sporting and so forth, but not so large as to be um, as to cause the additional harms from mass shootings and law enforcement confrontations. Basically, the idea was, was the idea to force manufacturers to make a magazine that could only... That was... Well, I don't know if it was to force. The idea, the thought was that that would happen. But then when, when it, uh, it became... When it was said that it wouldn't happen, uh, and the law was amended to make the capacity limit 10 because there already existed 10-round capacity magazines and to achieve the seven compromise number through a load limit, recognizing that it would have a lesser um, effectiveness than the 10 limit, but where it operated, it would save, it, it would uh, uh, eliminate the consequences of those last three, of, of those last three bullets. Uh, it, to be sure, the most important feature of this whole structure is the 10 round capacity limit on magazines, isn't it true, though, that with semi-automatic handguns, that before these recent bans, that many of the tip typical handguns purchased for home protection, semi-automatic pistols, had magazines w which had a greater uh, capacity than 10 rounds? Not all, but many, right? I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm well, sure in the record it says that, doesn't it? Right. Pardon me? In the record it I says that, right? I believe so. I'm not confident about that answer. But the notion here, the, the target of this, sorry about the word, but the, tar the target of this uh, legislation is the, 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 the rapid fire, the semi-automatic fire of large numbers. You can pick the number. You can pick 10. Some states have picked 15. You could pick 7 or 5. The rapid firing of large number of bullets without the pause that allows either the person who has... Uh, gone a little bit berserk to stop and think, or the victims to hide, or law enforcement to intervene. That pause uh, to reload provides an important opportunity to save lives, and yet there is no uh, evidence in the record that it is that that, that large firing capacity is necessary uh, for self-defense. I don't think there's a factual dispute about how often these a large number of bullets rapidly fired would be necessary for self-defense. The dispute between the parties on that point is not factual but legal. I think they agree that defensive use seldom, if ever, requires more than brandishing or a few shots. They just claim that it's conceivable that more would be needed and they're entitled to arm themselves for maximum effectiveness against a rare and even speculative event. That's in their um, response, their second brief at page 26. But that can't be right because that would mean the Second Amendment guarantees the right to the most powerful firearms that exist, and that can't be the law. Um, the burden, I, I guess my, my time is up. If I could make one more point, it's that the burden on, on the um, right of armed self-defense uh, doesn't become more severe because many people want to have these features on their weapons. The Second Amendment is not a popularity contest or a consumer preference contest. Heller's emphasis on the handgun as the quintessential self-defense weapon was, a, was a, a way of explaining why the breadth of that ban was unacceptable. It did not establish a rule saying that you take a vote and popularity answers the question whether reasonable regulation is permissible or not. Yes, I'm sorry, one question before you sit down. Uh, it's uh, maybe two components, but uh, one of the arguments uh, that are, that's made by your adversary 
is that the all this evidence that we've got in this multi-volume appendix uh, was not before the legislature, or much of it was not before the legislature when it made its decision, um, the various decisions and various uh, limits. Uh, what's your response to that? And they say that, that we should consider that in determining um, uh, if we... But I think that's wrong for two reasons. One, um, it... This legislation was part of an ongoing effort over years to deal with the problem of, of mass shooting, of, of what are being called assault weapons. The legislature that passed this law had been considering the problem, had a previous law that existed, was patterning its laws after the federal law or deciding where the federal law or the prior state law had gaps in it. And much of this evidence was either before Congress or before uh, the New York legislature on a prior occasion. This is not a, they didn't just step in when this law was passed and, and decide what to do on a clean slate. They were dealing with an area in which they had already been acting with quite ample evidence before them. That's one point. Um, and beyond that, of course, this court and, and other courts have made clear that in deciding the reasonableness of a law, that a legislature is not an administrative agency whose judgment is to be assessed on the basis of the administrative record before it. If, in fact, its judgment was reasonable and is supported by evidence, the role, the role of the court is just to make sure of that, to make sure that it isn't uh, going off the rails. But uh, Evidence that is publicly available on the public record uh, is has uh, routinely been used by this court and other courts to assess the those questions about legislative facts. Thanks very much, Mr. Thompson. Oh, oh we're going to do. Let's yeah, we do it. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's the arrangement you've worked out. Thank you. Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Maura Murphy Osborne. I'm an assistant attorney general for the state of Connecticut and with me at council table is Michael Scold, also an attorney general, assistant attorney general for the state of Connecticut and we represent the defendants in the Shoe versus Malloy matter. Your Honor, the Connecticut Act that's at issue in this litigation will have a meaningful impact in reducing the lethality and the injuriousness of gun crime incidents in Connecticut when they do occur and this court should uphold the act in its entirety. The act is consistent with this court's precedents in the area of firearms regulations, in particular Kachalski, DeCastro, and Kwong, and it is also consistent with United States Supreme Court precedent of Heller and McDonald. This court has appropriately found in other cases that in this area of firearms regulations, the determination and the legislative choices of the of the legislature, state legislature, such as those that are contained in this act, are entitled to deference by this court. Your Honor, plaintiffs, we heard plaintiffs' counsel claim that the state failed to give any consideration or analysis about whether or not this law would have a meaningful impact on gun violence, and that claim is simply wrong. The act will have a meaningful, act, meaningful impact on gun crime in Connecticut. The act will, will reduce the lethality and the injuriousness of gun crime incidents when they do occur. By one estimate of an expert, an assault weapon ban, like the one contained in the Connecticut Act, will help to reduce gunshot victimization by up to 5%. A 5% reduction... Now, Popper was also an expert in your case, is that correct? Uh, in our case, he was our, our expert. We, we submitted an affidavit from him. He is really the only person that has thoroughly examined the federal assault weapon ban that was in, that banned both assault weapons and large capacity magazines. So your adversary, I think, rightly points out that his affidavits, I guess plural, um, are somewhat equivocal with respect to the impact of a, an assault weapon ban. Wouldn't you agree? No, I don't agree. And uh, what plaintiffs have done repeatedly throughout this litigation is to cherry pick and distort Dr. Coper's findings. So it's important to understand Dr. Coper's role in studying this issue. He's really the only expert that has thoroughly examined it. He was charged by, as part of the enactment of the federal ban, he was charged with studying 
the effects of the federal ban. So he prepared a report in 1997, just three years after the ban was in effect. And it's that 1997 report where he did equivocate about the effectiveness of the federal ban that plaintiffs rely on extensively. Dr. Coper, in our case, and in, a, in another uh, publication he did in 2013. Distanced himself from or explained those prior declarations. And, and he did that, and he also noted that he had, that, um, he had additional evidence to look at. So really his 1997 report that you'll see plaintiffs rely upon extensively was pretty much superseded by both his 2004 report um, and then subsequently his ability, in our case, he was able to look at information like the Mother Jones data compilation about mass killings in particular. He examined that and studied it. He was also able to look at a study done by the Washington Post regarding the um, the large capacity magazine ban, and he concluded looking at that data that the act, like Connecticut's act, will have um, a meaningful impact on gun violence incidents. Um, even a small reduction in gunshot victimization uh, will yield substantial uh, quant and quantifiable societal benefits. By one estimate, even just a 1% decrease in gunshot victimization would yield something around $19 million a year. And if you factor in less, um, less tangible societal benefits, um, some estimates are that the savings to society would be $1 million per shooting, or approximately $750 million annually saved. A ban on large capacity magazines, such as that contained in the Connecticut Act, will be especially useful in combating the lethality and injuriousness of gunshot victimization. Bans, un count, unlike what plaintiffs just claimed, that there was no evidence that um, bans on large capacity magazines have an impact, that's completely wrong. Bans on long, large capacity magazines have been shown to reduce the presence of those magazines in the civilian gun market over time. The Washington Post study that I referenced a moment ago uh, showed that as a result, toward the end of the federal ban period, the 10-year period, um, results were really starting to show and that there was a 44% 44 de 44 decrease in the use of large capacity magazines in one geographic area towards the end of that 2000, that 10 year period. What do you, what do you say about this, the question I asked your, uh, asked uh, your adversary about, um, before these bans went into effect uh, on large capacity magazines, that I don't know if it's most, but certainly many of the semi-automatic uh, pistols that were sold and that were used for home protection, which is discussed so much in Heller, had more than a 10 round capacity in, in their clips. Isn't that true that, that most of the handguns that were sold before the, the ban on large capacity magazines exceeded a 10 round clip? Um, many did, Your Honor, but I think you need to be careful at, at looking at plaintiff's evidence in that regard because they do make those claims of somewhere, even just looking at handguns, they do make those claims that some something like uh, you know, 30 or 40 percent of semi-automatic pistols would, would hold more than a 10-round magazine. But if you look closely at their data, that's often a snapshot, and it's often a snapshot of a more modern, recent time. And it, it, it doesn't show you any percentages about um, gun ownership generally or pistol ownership generally. Um, there's something estimated to be around 310 million firearms in possession in the United States. So their data about how many semi-automatic pistols or AR-15s that were produced in, say, 2011 doesn't really give you an accurate picture. Um, but moreover, we don't, we don't um, think that even, even as counsel for New York, the Solicitor General of New York mentioned, it's not really, the Second Amendment isn't driven by a consumer choice issue, that that doesn't um, mean that there's an encroachment on any, any well, ability. But there's certainly language about in common use and protection of the home in Heller. The right that the court found in Heller was a right of law-abiding citizens to engage in self-defense um, but with arms in the, to protect their hearth at home. So there's no discussion. And the handgun is the, the most appropriate way to do that, the court said, right? It's yes. the easiest and best way to do that. 
It did. It found that the handgun was the quintessential self-defense weapon. But this act doesn't um, prohibit handguns in any way. This act is about a very small set, subset of semi-automatic handguns. So many handguns aren't even semi-automatic. Some are revolvers. And well, far fewer revolvers are sold today than they were 20 years ago. The, the evidence is that too, right? That's true, and that's one of the concerns in the state interest, is the growing militarization of our civilian gun market. So while gun manufacturers and, and a small segment of gun owners, maybe 1% of, of um, or probably less than 1%, because most people who own something like an AR-15, the, the plaintiff's own evidence shows they tend to own more than one. So even if AR-15s and the like are oh, just 1% of the 310 million guns in civilian um, circulation, that's not even 1% of the people. So um, just because a small, this small number of people wants to have these very militaristic weapons. He's, he's, he said a number of 4.2 million people. I believe the numbers, the numbers the plaintiffs rely on um, vary somewhat. They're more, first was that 3.97 million AR-15s are estimated to be in ownership. Their more recent numbers are something like 4.7 million AR-15s. But even when you compare that to 310 million firearms generally, um, that's still not a large percent. And it certainly but isn't the typically court, owned. didn't the district court find that they were in common use? The district court did find that, um, and then just engaged in the the two-step intermediate scrutiny um, analysis and upheld the, the law. As to the magazines as well, right? Yes. I see my time is, is nearly um, ended, so I, I would just respectfully request that um, and submit to this court that the act will advance Connecticut's interest in reducing the number and, of deaths and injuries caused in gun crime incidents, and particularly in the most horrific types of gun crime incidents, incidents, mass public shootings, which I didn't have an opportunity to discuss with you, but the evidence is substantial and overwhelming that on estimate um, somewhere in the range of 10 fewer people are, sh are killed in these mass public shooting incidents when more conventional weapons are used. And so, in other words, 10 more people are killed or injured when these assault weapons or large capacity magazines are used. And that's obviously a very important state interest. Um, the act leaves citizens to free to select many firearms for adequate and effective self-defense in the home, which is the right found in Heller. So the state of Connecticut respectfully submits to this court that the act should be, should be upheld in its entirety and that the decision of the trial court should be affirmed. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Um, so I'd like to begin by uh, analyzing the question of whether we've been distorting or cherry-picking Professor Cooper's statement. Let's start with his supplemental declaration in this case. The last thing he had to say where, where about is that? that is at uh, Joint Appendix New York 2236 and Joint Appendix Connecticut 1412. And he said, quote, there is little evidence little evidence on how state assault weapons bans affect the availability and use of assault weapons, close quote. In 2004, he said, quote, it is unknown, unknown whether further restrictions on outward features of semi-automatic weapons, such as banning weapons, having any military features will produce measurable benefits beyond those restricting magazine capacity. That's at New York 572 and Connecticut 1685. And that statement highlights something that is critical for this court. If the court takes nothing from my argument away from this, I would hope it would be that there are two laws at stake here. There are two bans. They need to be analyzed separately. The state wants to sort of blur this distinction and make it sound like uh, they're, 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 it's one law. There are two bans, and the court needs to look at each. Also, Professor Coper said, and this is New York, JA 545, 2004, said, quote, What's the number again? Uh, uh, JA 545 of New York. And it, he said, quote, if anything, therefore, gun attacks appear to have been more lethal and injurious since the ban, but in the close original, quote. But in the original, uh, the, the most recent uh, uh, affidavit he provided, 
He did say one should not conclude, however, that such bans will have no effect on public safety. As discussed above, if allowed to operate over the long run, such bans can potentially reduce the number and lethality of gunshot victimizations, etc. He, did, he still makes the same conclusion, though, right? Well, it's not the same conclusion, and he, he admits he has little evidence for it. I mean, he reaches this conclusion, but under Turner 1 and 2, he has to have substantial evidence. He can't just come in as a paid expert and, and opine on this. He has to have substantial evidence, and he said, I have little evidence, or it's unknown, not that I have substantial evidence. Where does substantial evidence come from? That comes from uh, the Turner... Like administrative... To, Turner 1 and Turner 2, and Kachalski on four occasions cites to Turner 1 as the standard. So this court has embraced that. Um, in addition, uh, there was a question about um, whether whether Heller really just deals with handguns, whether you know handguns are the best for self-defense. Uh, nothing in Heller suggests that it's confined, in fact, to handguns. They said... The, it, the Second Amendment prima facie extends to all, all bearable arms, close quote. And Justice Stevens in McDonald said in his dissent, the gravamen of the complaint is that uh, the, the plaintiffs want to have a handgun or a gun of their own choosing. Uh, he was very explicit that it was not confined, that Heller was not confined to handguns. Um, in addition, uh, there's a question about will lethality and injuriousness decline. You know, as we pointed out, Professor Coper himself said after the 94 ban, 10-year ban, it didn't. And that was a national ban. This is one state. There are 44 states that don't have this ban. There are 75 million of them in circulation. They do not have <clears throat> any evidence to suggest that criminals will not go out and find these magazines in one of the other 44 states. And they don't have any evidence as to if the criminals are thwarted somehow, what will they use instead? And they haven't given any consideration to what the defensive gun use implications are. They're looking at this from the side, from the perspective of how are criminals going to misuse this, whereas Heller teaches that's the wrong question. That was what the district said. The right question is how are law-abiding, responsible citizens going to use these firearms and these magazines? Thank you very Thank much. You. We reserve the decision. Excellent arguments and uh, excellent briefs. Oh, we have another one surfacing. How have you done this? There's a cross appeal, so I believe uh, Ms. Underwood. Whatever you want. Speak about the cross I'm, appeal. <laughs> I'm easy. Okay, I just I, just a few points. I wanted to make the point that while Professor Coper may have expressed some uncertainty about features, he did not express any uncertainty about about large capacity magazines. The problem with the data about large capacity magazines is that in New York, until recently, there was a huge grandfathering of large capacity magazines. This was an attempt to solve that problem. As I said before, this legislation builds on prior legislation. Can I ask you about your cross appeal, though? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, that is this <laughs> issue of muzzle brakes, the misspelling of brakes. Is there another? Is there another use of the <clears throat> B R E A K? Not only is there. Cause, there let me there, just finish my question. I'm sorry. That would cause confusion because it seems to be admitted that it should have been brakes like on a car, right? But it was misspelled in the legislation. But is there a likelihood of confusion that people won't know what you're talking about? There is not. The plaintiffs have never suggested that there is. And a little Googling will show you that this misspelling is actually fairly common, too. There is no other thing called a muzzle break with the other spelling. This misspelling is fairly common as a misspelling of the thing that is a break on the muzzle that is designed to limit Recoil. Plaintiffs have never suggested that there was any confusion. They've just identified a misspelling and a common one at that. Um, on the um, on, on the effectiveness, potential effectiveness of the load limit of the seven uh, gun uh, load limit. Um, obviously, there's no data because it hasn't been tried. Um, there's simply reason and sense, and the legislature is allowed to do that. That is, if the evidence supports limiting the number of bullets that are available, the number of rounds that are available to be used, if that is a, a reasonable judgment, and if a limitation to 10 is a reasonable judgment or a limitation to 7 is one, then achieving it by this particular mechanism um, uh, is also... Uh, they can presumably um, 
act on the basis of intuition, right? No, they, this has not been a, this not, is not unheard of. That's correct, but I think the point is that this isn't intuition about the whole area. There is evidence about the effect of limiting, the, the beneficial effect on victims of mass shootings and law enforcement confrontations of limiting the number of rounds available and the lack of detriment to, or there's no evidence showing that there's, there's generally conceded that it's not important at these high numbers for armed self-defense. And so then you get to the question of what number, and there isn't evidence that you could possibly have controlled studies about 10 versus 9 versus 8 versus 7. Well, there's, man, there's some manufactured post hoc evidence from Lucy Allen. Yes. Uh, that 7 seems to be a cliff effect in terms of what's actually used for 7. There is, and that's why the legislature was initially going for 7, and then finding it impractical, they went for... 10, which is a pre-existing magazine that is already marketed with the seven load limit for law-abiding citizens who keep their guns loaded and those guns might be used by somebody other than the law-abiding citizen um, who, who uses them. It can't be the law that because some, some people will evade the law, that proves that the law will have no effect. Uh, and Your time is up. Thank you. A little crib sheet doesn't quite explain how all of this was worked out amongst you, but whatever you want. How about you? What do you, what do you have to say to that? Well, I, I no, don't. I don't. I, I have nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Now we'll reserve decision, and now I'll tell you how good your arguments were, even after the segue, the uh, postscript. Thank you very much.